In 1960, driven by a nationalistic spirit and with strong determination, several young Catholic scholars who studied in the Netherlands decided to found a university in Indonesia, which was later named Universitas Katolik Indonesia Atmajaya. Supported by President Sukarno, these scholars were granted land in the Semanggi area in Jakarta, a very strategic location on which to build the university. The period of 2015 to 2019 is the most crucial milestone for Unika Atmajaya as the university develops its third campus. Each campus with its own characteristics will serve the nation. The Semanggi campus will serve as the center for nation development. The Pluit campus will serve as the center for health development. The PSD campus, which is still being constructed, will serve as the center for human development. Currently, Atma Jaya offers undergraduate, graduate, and professional programs in various fields of study. These programs are run in eight faculties. The Faculty of Economics and Business, the Faculty of Administration Business and Communication, the Faculty of Education and Language, the Faculty of Engineering, Faculty of Law, Faculty of Medicine, the Faculty of Psychology, and the Faculty of Technobiology. Besides attending lectures, the students are encouraged to be actively involved in developing their soft skills sports research leadership journalism and religious life At this university, I had the chance to win the Student Achievement Awards in 2016. Thus, I had the opportunity to develop myself and to meet a lot of friends who are passionate and are top students in their fields. I also received a scholarship that was very helpful for my studies. I think Atma Jaya educates us to develop critical and analytical thinking skills. These skills are essential for me to have a thorough understanding of my area of study. Numerous scholarship programs offered by Atma Jaya, either from Atma Jaya or abroad, have extensively facilitated students to pursue their studies, and I'm grateful to be one of the awardees. Unika Atma Jaya also has several research centers, including Center for Community Empowerment and Atma Jaya Venture. These institutions are the manifestations of our commitment to continuously improve our academic quality and our contributions to solve the problems within the community. Unika Atma Jaya also actively seeks partnerships with leading universities from around the world. We also work together with various education consortia through knowledge sharing, discussions, and joint research, such as collaboration with U.S. scholars. Through the fields of study we offer, Atma Jaya is committed to continuously providing the best quality of education in order to build a bright and intelligent next generation that will strive to improve social welfare. To achieve our vision and mission to become a university with the spirit of social entrepreneurship, we commit to develop excellent research that is based on social and industrial needs. Based on the quality, I believe that Atma Jaya was the best choice for me. In addition, the campus is strategically located. I decided to adjust my schedule and activities to enroll at Atma Jaya. So, I think Atma Jaya was the right choice for me. Atma Jaya is a great university 
and I hear that Atmajaya is a popular at Faculty of Law, and I'm so satisfied being a student at Atmajaya. Atmajaya is a great place to study, and it has a great quality for my education. Rooted in values of Christianity, excellence, professionalism, and care, Atmajaya invite you to join us to develop your knowledge and horizons and to give back to Indonesia. All right, uh, good afternoon, May 1, and uh, maybe good morning and evening for those in different time zones. Uh, welcome to our event uh, today. So as you may already know, uh, today we're going to discuss a book uh, written by our colleague uh, Ratri Istania uh, titled uh, Territorial Change and Conflict in Indonesia, Confronting the Fear of uh, Secession. Uh, I just want to mention uh, before we start that uh, this event is a part of discussion series that we're going to have during April and May 2023. Uh, if you are interested to sign up uh, for our other discussions for the next uh, month, uh, please uh, just uh, click on the link that uh, is in the chat box, I believe. Uh, before uh, we start, we I also want to thank you for our sponsor for our discussion today, uh, Routledge uh, Institute for Public uh, Policy of Atmajaya and Institute for Advanced uh, Research of Atmajaya. <clears throat> uh, so today's event, uh, as you may know, uh, we're going to discuss uh, uh, Ratri's uh, book published by Routledge. Uh, territorial change and conflict in Indonesia confronting the fear of secessions. Uh, the book itself, uh, it's a return based on her PhD dissertation at Political Science Department at uh, Loyola University, uh, Chicago. Uh, before uh, we start, I also want to mention that if you are interested in purchasing uh, the book, uh, Routledge has uh, kindly given us 20% uh, discounts. Uh, which is a very good opportunity for you. Uh, you can just download the information how to uh, access the discount. Uh, the information I believe is in the chat box and you can just follow the instruction from there. And I also believe the uh, Routledge will give you uh, free shipping costs, uh, which is great. I think personally, uh, this book will be very interesting for those of you who have research interests uh, lie in a field like conflict, uh, secessionist movements, subnational politics, Indonesian studies, and Southeast Asian studies. Uh, before we start, I just want to introduce you our uh, main speaker, uh, Ratri Sania. So Ratri is a senior lecturer at Polytechnic Stialan Jakarta. She is also a senior researcher at Pokoli Center a survey research institute based in Jakarta. Her works have been published in academic journals such as Asian Journal of Political Science and other popular outlets uh, such as uh, The Conversation. Uh, besides Ratri, we also have our three uh, discussions uh, for today. The first is Arita Nugraheni. Uh, is a researcher at uh, Compass, uh, an Indonesian uh, national newspaper. We also have Nino Fiertasiwi, a senior lecturer from President University. And lastly, uh, we also have Rita Padawangi, lecturer from Singapore University of Social Science. Uh, before uh, we start, I just want to explain a little bit about uh, our today's uh, round down. So we're going to give uh, Ratri's like uh, 15 minutes of presentations. And after that, we'll give opportunities for discussions to convey the uh, comments and thoughts about uh, Ratri's book and presentations. 
uh, each discussion will have like a 10 minutes each. Then we will open up uh, the Q&A sessions. So uh, without further ado, uh, Ratri, uh, the time is yours. Thank you so much, Fajar. Uh, I probably start share the screen first. Okay, is it clear enough? Hang on. Okay. Everything's look good. So, okay, I'm going to start my presentations. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending my book launching. It is a great pleasure to meet all of you this afternoon, Jakarta's time, and those from other time zone. Before I begin my book presentations, please allow me to express my gratitude for people who have made this prestigious event possible. Lessons from pandemic crisis have provided us with the most convenient way to be connected across border and across nationalities. Work of academy has been easier than ever to be shared and refined using digital platforms. I am feeling more than lucky to work with Routledge, especially Dorothea, Sarah Meliani, and Institute of Public Policy at Atmajaya University, as well as IFAR. Mbak Indri, Mas Fajar, Mas Yos, Mas Matius, and others. I would also like to thank Rector of Atma Jaya, Dr. Prasenthia Toko, who has made this event possible. I also want to thank you to my amazing discussions, Mbak Arita, Mbak Nino, and my dear friend, Rita. Okay, without saying further, let me begin my brief presentations about my book. Indonesia's territorial changes are linked to the 1999 phenomenon of Pemakaran or region splitting. Currently, Indonesia has 514 districts or regencies, or we call it as Kabupaten Kota, and 38 provinces, with four new provinces added in Papua region itself in 2022. This book focuses on territorial change and conflict, and aims to answer two questions. First, how the new province claim increases conflict in the supporting districts? Second, how competitions among diverse elites in districts pursuing a new province precipitated conflict within the region? The argument behind this book is that more provinces may be necessary to ensure the fair distributions of wealth that would enable the whole population to enjoy a similar quality of life, and that the Indonesian government need to wisely and strategically uphold its unity if a federal arrangement is not an option. The central theme of this book centers around Indonesia, of course, and the driver behind escalating conflict severity, resulting from competition between identity-affiliated groups vying for a new province. Employing a rigorous quantitative study supplemented by case studies of various Indonesian provinces, the research provides robust evidence to support the hypothesis that group fragmentations is a key factor in determining the intensity of conflict that emerged during the course of a new province struggle. The study's finding offer more perspective on the complex dynamics of identity-based competitions in Indonesia and their implications for conflict resolutions efforts in similar settings. The book also talks about how to prevent conflicts when creating new provinces by considering ethno-federal or federal structures and power sharing arrangement. It suggests being cautious when creating new provinces along ethnic lines. Conflict is likely to happen during the early stages of establishing a new province, especially at the district level. The book contributes to the ongoing policy debates on Indonesia's Pemekaran, but creating a new province is more difficult than creating a new district. So it is important to recall that many new provinces may claim the right to break from their mother 
or we call it as original provinces, at the same time as district proliferations begins to have an effect on the country. District proliferations is limited to a single district split and any conflict that arises as a result of the split could be contained within the boundaries of the parent and child districts. However, because a new province demand involves more than one district and additional interest at risk, the conflict outcome may be different. The baseline model examines the impact of the new province, which I'll be presenting that later. So here are my hypotheses. There are two of them. The first one, <clears throat> districts that join together to demand a new province are more likely to cause conflict at the district level. The second one, when a district regroup to launch a new province campaign, it is likely to face more conflict when it reaches the initiation stage at the district level. The underlying assumptions here is that the initial stage of a new province applications may spark political competitions among elites from diverse identity affiliated groups, which could lead to a new province proposal being rejected. These groups are aspiring for future executive positions in the new province. If the elites are unable to establish a consensus on a number of important issues, the conflict will deteriorate further. So here are my findings. First, I would like to present the quantitative study first. So basically I'm using, or I replicate the study of district proliferation's effect on ethnic conflict. The studies being uh, conducted by Basi and Gajian, I replicate this study and find the similar finding which is district proliferation does not have any significant impact to ethnic group conflict or conflict itself per se. After including ethnic diversity and several other measures, um, I also find the similar finding, which is no um, significant effect on um, ethnic uh, group conflict. They or their study suggests that Indonesian government should um, proliferate or mekarkan um, district or kabupaten kota along ethnic lines. So here are my own study. My own study include two steps. The first one, um, measuring the impact of new province demand and conflict itself. As you can see from the statistical testing, new province demand is likely and have significant effect on the conflict. After including in the second model, ethnic diversity, it still also have an, um, a significant impact to the conflict, um, uh, conflict itself. And um, the third model, including all the um, um, uh, control variables, um, the result is also the same, significant, although um, it's less. Uh, than the first and the second model. So the second one, the second fun one I'm um, using um, policy stages as the predictors. There is a, a initiation stage and uh, there is uh, proposals be uh, becomes bill of new provinces. So those are the policy making stages, which means that uh, I observe each one of the policy impact to uh, the likelihood of conflict. We can see in here from the statistical table, the policy stage number one, which is the initiations, is the one that is likely to have a significant effect uh, compared to other uh, policy stage. Although we can also observe other policy stage has significant impact, but we cannot see that um, this effect is higher than initiations um, uh, process. So what about the qualitative study? And the qualitative, qualitative studies um, uh, serve as the complementary to the quantitative study. The qualitative study has more in-depth observations. And for that, uh, I'm using cross-case selections. There are four. 
um, uh, uh, cases um, um, that are used um, um, using uh, several predictors. The combination of several predictors, um, district proliferations, new province, no district proliferations, and no new, prof new, uh, new province. The first case study is BIMA. Um, is a district with the rural characteristics. Uh, Bima district split into Bima city in 20, uh, uh, sorry, 2002. Um, Bima district and also Bima uh, city, they are um, less homogeneous and nearly homogeneous populations. The second case study is Chirabon. So Chirabon districts different than the first case study. Uh, because they are more uh, homog uh, more heterogeneous, and um, is uh, also has an urban setting with mixed ancestry and lack of proliferations between 2000 until 2014. The Chirabonis are of Sundanese and Javanese ethnicity, making it harder for elites to gather support for secession from the mother province within a single ethnic identity. The third case study is Tana Toraja. So Tana Toraja itself uh, indicates that this region has an almost homogeneous populations and is more rural compared to Cirebon, of course. In 2008, the district was divided into Tana Toraja and Toraja Utara. Um, it aims to improve local administrations and nothing more than that. Despite demands from the adjacent Luwu's ethnic group to establish Luwu Raya province, the minority Christian Torajans opted to develop their own districts instead of joining a new province effort. The fourth case study is Purwakarta. It is a null case. Purwakarta itself presents a district with no district proliferations or demand for a new province. This rural district has an almost homogeneous population and shares the Sundanese heritage with other districts in West Java province. Although it had a relatively uh, unpopular past, the district's course was changed by one region or Bupati. Purwakarta has also very few violent incidents on an annual basis. So let's see here. So I'm showing you the map of my field research. And here are the propositions. So starting from uh, Sumbawa, the case of uh, Bima district, I will begin to elaborate my finding. The inability of elites from two districts with less homogeneous populations to resolve their differences during a campaign for a new province could result in more conflict, especially if the minority ethnic group involved, such as the Mbojo, is of similar strength and size to another group like the Samawa. Both groups reside in a geographical area with a suburban characteristic separated by a natural boundary, such as seawater and rough terrain. The elites, who are almost homogeneous, found the bargaining process challenging, resulting in a delay in the creations of a new province, which could increase district level conflict. This is the map of um, Chirbon. This is the second case study. So the history of a heterogeneous district can lead to challenges during the bargaining process for a new province and potential conflicts, although they may not be as severe. For instance, Chirabon is an urban district with a diverse population may have a list who hesitate to advocate for a new province due to the lack of a monolithic identity. This campaign can also face difficulties in bargaining with other districts such as Kuningan and Majalengka, which do not share similar ethnic class or background affiliations. The second case study finding is from Toraja. Toraja and its child district Toraja Utara are known for their homogeneity and peaceful nature. The Torajan people have managed to preserve their unique culture and traditions with the influence of local aristocratic elites. Despite being a minority group with a predominantly Muslim populations in South Sulawesi province, 
Torajans are mostly rural and Christian. As a result, political leaders in such homogeneous district should prioritize peaceful bargaining to maintain a low level of conflict. Now the last case, which is a null case, Purwakarta. In a district with a homogeneous population and no aspiration whatsoever for, for regional proliferation, there is a higher likelihood of low conflict. Conflict is still there. However, the absence of regional proliferation alone cannot guarantee low conflict levels. Other factors, such as leadership style and cultural innovations, also play a significant role. Although these factors may cause some frictions initially, they can ultimately lead to a rapid economic development in the district. Therefore, it is essential for district to have effective leadership and promote cultural innovations to maintain a peaceful and prosperous community. Sorry. In conclusion, this book has identified key findings regarding ethnic and religious diversity in emerging countries. We have outlined policy proposals that can be used to promote social cohesion and economic development in this context. To build on this research, further investigation is needed to better understand the nuance of diversity and its impact on various societal act factors. By implementing the proposed policies and continuing to explore this topic, we can create a more harmonious and prosperous future for emerging countries with similar ethnic and religious diversity. That is all my brief book presentation. Hope it will stimulus to a further engaging discussion. Comments and criticism are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you again for giving me an opportunity to share my work with you. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ratri, for your very uh, exciting uh, presentations about your book. Uh, now, I want to give an opportunity to Mba Aditra to give her thoughts about uh, Ratri's books and presentations. Uh, you, you'll you have like a five to 10 minutes, Mba Aditra. And so please go ahead. Thank you, Mas Fajar. Thank you for the opportunity to serve as a discussion for this book launch. It is a privilege to be here today to engage with this thought-provoking work and to have the chance to exchange ideas with the author and the audience. Uh, I want to start by thanking the author, Muratri, for the hard work and dedication in producing this book. It is no small feat to write a book and I'm impressed by Burati's ability to produce such a compelling and insightful work. Uh, by the way, I, I would like to share some story. The first time I became acquainted with Burati's was through her opinion column in Compass in 2015. Maybe you remember Burati, in which she discussed uh, about yes, the and I'm afraid, Trump. And I'm afraid that uh, you recall that. <laughs> <laughs> Social and neutral. It was, um, yeah, it's about the presidential chair of staff. And I found Buratri so. That's the thing. <laughs> I want Buratri inside this to be valuable at that time to understanding the national political landscape. And then since then, I have become more familiar with Buratri, especially with uh, your role as a senior researcher at the Popular Center. And yeah, I secretly admire to do her your significant contribution to the field that I align uh, that align with my recent work. So well, uh, I had the pleasure reading Territorial Change and Conflict Indonesia. Uh, as a social science enthusiast, I appreciate uh, how Buratri inno innovate approach to study the complex relationship between regional proliferation and conflict in Indonesia. And the book presents a rich analysis of the interplay between territorial change and violence, providing insight into the political and social dynamic of Indonesian recent history. Well, in response to the book, I would like to share three points that stood out to me and that I hope worth discussing further. 
First of all, I found Guratri's book to be a comprehensive and informative analysis of the issue of decentralization in Indonesia. Her book offers valuable insight into the impact of decentralization on local politics, ethnic identity consideration, and also territorial expansion. Guratri uh, begins with the give a really good context, begins with the Asian financial crisis of 1997 and the subsequent decentralization project uh, by the World Bank, which aimed to demonstrate, uh, democratize and decentralize local politics by devolving national politics, political, administrative, and financial power to the local level. And while uh, to put, while decentralization has allowed Indonesian to express their political and ideological beliefs with greater freedom than before, there has been a rejection here yeah, and any suggestion for new province based on ethnic, ethnic identity consideration. So one of the most appealing aspect of the book is how Guratri investigates whether there is a conflict between districts that, that are campaigning for the new province and that those that are not. So it's quite give a, 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 fire, a broader understanding. So additionally, uh, Buratri assess the degree of risk for the conflict at each stage of the province, province's pro proliferation policy making process, uh, which, um, which make the book highly relevant, I think, yeah, uh, highly relevant to policy makers and researcher that interested in understanding the dynamic uh, of territorial expansion and uh, conflict in Indonesia. And also the book is uh, highlights the challenge associated with the demand for territorial expansion, which cannot be separated for the elite's desire for increasing increased political control in a larger geographical unit. Buratri, Buratri argues, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but Buarti urges that this preoccupation with the battle for the new profit may cause elites or the government to overlook the major demands of the general populace and thereby worsening an already precarious economic and political circumstance. So in light of this Buarti profile, the benefit of the book, policymaker should consider analyzing the ethnic, the ethnic composition and other characteristics of area that support the creation of new province, this would, this would help determine which demands for new province are more likely to result in conflict than others. Uh, so moreover, before granting new provision, provincial status, officials should also examine the power dynamic between elites and the people in the district that have campaign for such a status. It's personally really compelling for me since I learned about uh, anthropology in my study. Did this really see the people through their eyes? And second of all, I want to highlight the strength of this book, which lies in its methodology that combines both quantitative and qualitative approach. The author, who Ratri rightfully pointed out that only a few researchers have utilized a combination of large data and case study, making this book a valuable contribution to the field. Uh, yeah, Buratri using, um, uh, using data that span from 20 to 2014, I guess, during which data from the SNPK data set and political violence was thoroughly scrutinized and across district and province. While the quantitative analysis provides valuable insight, uh, Buratri found that it doesn't not offer a clear explanation of how variables interact to produce certain results. Uh, for instance, the mention in the book that the research was unable to determine if regional proliferation, particu particularly new province proliferation, is a direct source of conflict or violence at the district or local level. And other factors such as political competition among faction may also be at play, which can be difficult to identify through quantitative method. So Burati employ uh, an approach called 
accidental ethnography to better understand the context behind the information. And again, as an anthropology student where ethnography is the heart of the discipline, and also as a researcher at Libang Kompas, where we mainly use quantitative approach such as survey and polls to gather mass opinion, I found this approach to be particularly appealing and it has given me optimism uh, for combining ethnography and quantitative method in a few, my, uh, personally in my future studies. So, okay, uh, therefore I believe that this book has potential to become a role model for mixed method research on social and political issue in general. Uh, so lastly, because it's just three minutes for me, I would like to highlight the chapter of the case study in Bima, Cirebon, Tanah Toraja, and Purwakarta. I enjoy how Burati uh, telling the story in a storytelling style, which drew on sensory experience to provide a rich and nuanced understanding of the issues. Uh, but however, by immersing herself in this local context and engaging with the community members, the author presented the story in a chronological sequence. I would have been more interesting if the narrative could have shown how the research journey or story generate empathy that gave life to the research findings. So uh, in, in conclusion, uh, Burati's book provides a valuable analysis again of the impact uh, of decentralization on local politics, ethnic identity consideration and territorial expansion in Indonesia, and the, middle, and the methodology which combine quantitative and qualitative approach over a new perspective on the complex relationship between regional proliferation and conflict in Indonesia. The case study provides a rich and nuanced understanding of the issue. So it's not make us bored to uh, read some social book, science book. So and the overall, the book is valuable contribution to the and has the potential, I think, to become a role model for mixed method research on social and political issues in general. I guess that's for me. Thank you, Mas Fajar. All right. Uh, thank you, Arita, uh, for your uh, comments. Uh, Marathi, uh, do you want to respond to Arita's comments first before we move to Bernina? Sure, sure. Thank you yes, so much, uh, Mas Fajar. And thank you so much, uh, Mbak Arita. Such generous comments. I'm looking for a um, little bit of criticism. There is a little room uh, there that I would like to hear. But nonetheless, uh, I feel honored to hear your comments and seeing the perspective from someone who probably has never studied this way. Uh, I, I'm feeling really grateful especially when you highlight about the, you highlight uh, the very essence of my research correctly. So I would, I would really uh, like to see people from what I see. So your um, insight, I think really helps me to communicate my research furthermore, because the thing that I really want to convey this is not the options of um, you using the ability to produce policy for creating uh, new regions based on several indicators um, and to promote it um, to, to, to be uh, um, Indonesia becoming a federal country or stay in a unitary country. So the process of um, district proliferations or profit proliferation itself, the policymakers need to study it very deeply. So in order to, you cannot look out or look over the very detail of our own populations, which is basically ethnic diversity. So if you neglect that kind of a composition, cohesiveness, and you're losing the essence of the unity itself, and you will start it to think that other peoples that are different than you is not your friend. In group and out group is very dangerous. And that the thing that I would like really to highlight in this research. Another thing about the, the storytelling style. So Rita, remember, so Rita, 
the other discussions. Sorry, I remember. Remember that we all, both of us, um, has been very, very uh, grateful to have Professor Kathleen Adam. She's an anthropologist. So from her, I learned a lot about how to do ethnographic studies. So I have an honor to be in the same time of doing research in Toraj, actually, Barita, with her during my um, um, PhD year. So I went to the field in 2017. So I went there with her. It is just coincidence because she apparently had to do the, her own research and I had to do my own research. So by observing her also communicating with the local people, I can get the context. So I came back and learned about this um, accidental ethnography that is not really probably common in anthropology, but it's being used by political scientists because political scientists, they don't want to stay too long in the field. You can blame us. <laughs> so, uh, but that is how we understand uh, what's behind the people's interactions and tell whether there's a conflict or not. And um, I also have to be thankful for the, the late um, Li An Fuji. So her study also inspires me for uh, doing my research. So thank you so much for your comments, Marita. Okay, uh, thank you Marita for your uh, response. Uh, next, I want to invite uh, Bandino to give her comments and thoughts about uh, Ratri's presentations and book. Uh, you. Your time is 10 minutes, Bandino. Uh, no, yeah, thank you, uh, Mas Pajar, for this. Hello, everyone. I'm Nino Fiatasi from uh, President University. And first of all, I would like to congratulate, of course, uh, for uh, to the author, yeah, Dr. Ratri Istania, for the publication of the very very interesting book. Yeah, I've read uh, the whole book, and I uh, it the book uh, brings me into um, many reflection actually. Uh, also, not only about the new proliferation, but also about the identity um, politics that is being used for political consolidations. And for me personally, the book arrives actually in time in the midst of the formation of four new provinces in 2022 yeah, in the Papua region. And for me, uh, the book shed the light of the understanding of decentralization strategy uh, through regional autonomy in Indonesia. And this is one of, of course, uh, of one of many publication about the establishment of new provinces as a development strategy for uh, uh, by territorial autonomy. Yeah? However, the book focus that is on the nexus between pemekaran, regional proliferation, and the socio-political conflict in Indonesia, particularly uh, by looking at the district level, actually is a fresh approach because usually we are we are on the uh, focusing on the more uh, um, uh, other things, yeah, not from uh, looking at the new provincial. Uh, proliferation, regional proliferation from the district uh, uh, conflict. And secondly, <laughs> before I forget, I would also like to thank to the Institute of Public Policy, Universitas Kristen Atmajaya for giving me the honor to serve after a discussion for this very important book launching. Thank you, Uki. <laughs> so uh, I would like to share some opinions regarding the books and also probably one question or two for the uh, for Buratri. Yeah? Actually, first, when I read the title, <laughs> I hope to read about the risk of cessation, cessation and self-determination, actually in the sense of national cessation or independence movement, which threatens the territorial integrity of the states or sovereignty. Especially because I read first on the chapter Conclusion chapter or chapter nine, yeah. Buratri also briefly mentions the West Papua independence ambitions. Then I, I thought about, oh, so this is a book about uh, the conflict mentioned and the cessation mentioned here is about the state uh, territorial integrity, that uh, the state independence movement. 
And then I carefully read the introduction and other chapters and found that uh, the intention of this book is to explain cessation in a more organizational sense, yeah? which is the withdrawal from one administrative entity to develop a new administrative entity from mother province to a new province rather than um, independence movement. Uh, just like uh, cessation, use, the cessation with the word cessation usually uh, being understood. And I then I understand that the formation of new province is likely to follow or be followed by the struggle for political, economic, and social resources by the elites. It's like something that is always uh, uh, parallel with the pemekaran, yeah, the proliferation, regional proliferation, be it uh, on a district level or provincial level. And uh, Buratri aims to investigate the relationship between the development uh, of the new provinces and conflict, which is very, very important point to make, actually, and how the unique way to present the dynamic of regional expansion through the presentation of political struggles and conflict in the district level. Actually, as I mentioned before, is a new approach. It is also the one of the strengths of this book. And um, then uh, I have also noted uh, several um, strengths of this book. Yeah. First is that Buratri has been successfully shows the linkage between uh, the so the linkage yeah between uh, development of new provinces and conflict from the district level uh, conflict, and also about the conflict mechanism that uh, Buratri explains. Namely, first is in the early stage that is the introduction of the new idea of a new province to the public. That is the first mechanism for conflict. And second, at the start of the com campaign for a new provinces, when groups use their ethnic identity for political consolidations, political support, which triggers conflict, and the process of bargaining between various groups that usually mobilize through ethnic identity formation. So that, this is the mechanism of conflict that Buratri explains. And I think this is a very important one to note. And the third, the possi possibility of a failure, failure to, of consensus yeah, among ethnic, driven, ethnic identity driven groups that will try to trigger more intense conflict, actually, especially when the claim to a new province is rejected by the national government or mother province. And the third is the two cases that is that are described in detail in this book. The cases is illustrated, which is Bima and Chirabon, which fail to claim new provinces. And the case of Bima shows that when ethnic-based local elites are unable to reach a consensus on power sharing, their aspiration to form a new province failed because the ethnically-based political groups were equally powerful. The group were caught in protracted conflict that thwarted the political consolidation they needed to claim the new province. And in the Chirabon case, it shows that when ethnic groups are too diverse, it will be difficult to consolidate political power through ethnic identifications, resulting in weak political power to claim for new province. The diversity of ethnic groups unable to reach a consensus, according to this book, due to the lack of political consolidation. And that means that the violent conflict is likely, less likely to occur. But at the same time, it also means the less likely to claim a new province successfully. Very, very interesting one. And uh, I was surprised in the case of Toraja and Purwakarta because Buratri took a turn because there was no intention to claim a territorial change on the two districts, but the conflict persisted. Uh, a bit is very low in Purwakarta. Yeah? Uh, the case of uh, uh, Toraja, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, explain, um, illustrates that the intention to form a new province was absent when local elites were busy securing local political authority, local political contestation in their new uh, newly established districts. 
the conflict is more on local contestations based on intra and inter-ethnic relations. And the case of Purwakarta shows that the district elites has no had no intention of cessation in either the claims or of a new districts or new province. However, conflict, albeit small, yeah, still erupt in the social setting. So, as Buradri mentioned before, the absence of regional expansion cannot be equated with the absence of violence in the region. Uh, conflict, violence, conflict are still. Then it comes to the uh, after looking at how book how the book is very. I agree with the uh, the first discussion, uh, who says that um, the methodology is very important. Uh, is very interesting, and I'm a political scientist myself, and I'm trying to use ethnography for um, my research. But I haven't I haven't yet used uh, using um, uh, the quantitative data the, the 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 bigger data statistics data for my research uh, the methodology I agree is very very uh, interesting and uh, it can be the model of fu the future research including mine thank you for uh, the inspiration Buratri but I have some question that has been uh, bugging me. <laughs> for days and I am looking at the book again and again and I couldn't find the answer. So I hope Buratri would uh, be very um, kind to uh, answer this question. Very, very simple question. In the title, you mean um, about fears of uh, cessation. What fears as mentioned in the title that actually we need to, uh, we need to face? I don't think I got the gist of the fear of cessation that has to be faced according to this uh, the title of this book. Whose fear is it? Is it the fear of the government or the people? Uh, or is the provincial level cessation something to fear? <laughs> so that's my first question. And the second question that um, I want to uh, ask is about the take the reason of taking Purwakarta case when the intention for territorial change as the main idea stated in the title is not present in Purwakarta political sphere. So why Purwakarta? Because uh, when we talk only about conflict, then the title of the book discussing a conflict that is related or caused by territorial change. And I couldn't find um, the the uh, the reasoning of uh, the strong reasoning of taking Purwakarta. Why not my city Bekasi <laughs> or Pradang Paruli? Yeah, that's the second question that I want uh, to clarify. And um, about the, uh, the the third questions is about the power sharing about the elites. About uh, Buratri mentioned that. Uh, one of the suggestion is to have this uh, territorial chains based on ethnic lines uh, because of the diversity also uh, also a reality in Indonesia and it's very difficult to say that ethnic groups still hold a very strong uh, very strong uh, power politically in uh, Indonesia, many uh, many uh, many um, big provinces of Indonesia. So, how extent is power sharing possible in this uh, case of uh, territorial change in the future? And probably it's also related to the my fourth question. In the light of the recent territorial change with the development of new for uh, four new provinces in Papua region. What is uh, the potent, potential conflict that need to be anticipated according to Buratri? I, I know that it, it's not her, uh, her case study, but I want to apply this uh, new book about uh, the territorial change into the, the possibility of Papua case, because what is happening in the four new provinces are in Papua, are it's like more like a top-down policy rather than a uh, uh, it's uh, the, the the aspirations of the people. 
So that's probably my four questions. Sorry for uh, giving more uh, <laughs> questions rather than uh, uh, um, yeah. Um, I, I actually, those four questions are things that has been bugging me for few days after reading this very, very, very interesting book. Thank you, Ratri. Okay, uh, thank you, Vanino, for uh, reading uh, carefully the books and uh, thinking about those uh, four questions. Uh, Marathi, uh, do you want to respond to that? Sure, thank you so much, Mas Fajar. Um, let me uh, first say thank you so much, uh, Vanino, for taking time to study my book very diligently. <laughs> You even nailed to the questions that I was also wondering uh, first about the questions of the title itself, because I was going back and forth with my publisher and just only talking about um, should we or should we not put fear of secessions after the territorial change and conflict? That's your first questions, right? Um, my answer is to the publishers also, and hopefully it will satisfy you and others in here. Um, Indonesia after the reform era or after the 1999 with uh, the, the issuance of Undang-Undang um, Pemekaran Autonomi Daerah. So starting from that year until 2001, and then it subsided in 2003, there was an influx of a new provinces proposals and also new provinces proposal. And those proposals were accompanied by regions entertained the idea of being separated from Indonesia. Mostly those provinces that wanted to separate from the mother country, which is Indonesia, were those that are rich with resources and many of them using ethnic marker as their mobili mobilizations way uh, of campaigning. So that's the thing that the government, which is I targeted the national government, but you know, is not really for the local government, but the national government in Jakarta for them to view the separations as something that they need to study harder, looking into more deeper, like I said, about the ethnicity, about a different ethnic identity, but not only ethnic identity, but differences among them. There's religions and there are like many other kind of uh, identifiers that they need to study in compare only just thinking about administrative requirement. Administrative requirement can easily be fulfilled. But if we forget those kind of thing, look at those cases back in Balkan, look at those cases back in other countries, like in African countries, the, the polarizations can break down a country. So that's the thing that probably the idea of federation itself makes the government so fearful. I just want to tell them, Benino, don't be fearful of the potential secessions unless you had not, you haven't studied that much. So why I took those cases for the new provinces campaign, but they are all failed. Um, I have, I have, I think 19 new province professor that I studied from 2000 until 2014. However, why I studied the failed one. And from 19, there are four of them that actually emerge as new provinces in Papua, like you mentioned. So I don't know whether they for study my study, I don't think so, <laughs> but they probably have their own measurements on why they want to create those four provinces out of two provinces already there. So I remember according to one of the people as my key informant in Cirebon, not in other places, told me Cirebon, one of the consultants in Cirebon has this 
um, documents from the Dutch uh, colonialism period is already set in there and it won't be published anywhere, but you will be able to study it when you're going there. So Papua itself needs to be separated or divided with um, seven provinces. So uh, the reasons I asked the person, so why do we need to divide uh, Papua to seven uh, areas or provinces or whatever it is? So they said, because of ethnic lines, there are a lot of tribes in there and we need to study about them. And those that has been studied these uh, uh, regions, there are those people who studied Indonesia prior to the colonialization period. So that's very interesting to me. And now how many provinces are the Papua? So we cannot really separate, we cannot really separate the ethnic identity itself before we're making a decision, especially in the national level. You should see, you should study, don't be fearful. You have to confront the secessions. Indonesia is very potential to break apart. That's the thing, Marino. And then, okay, hopefully that can explain the number one questions. Yes. <laughs> the second one is about taking Purwakarta as one of my case study. It's a null case. So a null case means that uh, the predictors, first, the district proliferations, is there any district proliferations a proposal or not? And the second predictor, whether there is the new province demands or not. And the combinations of that will, um, will create um, a selections, uh, which is uh, the regions that I mentioned um, um, to you all. So, however, uh, Purwakarta um, selected because it doesn't have any of those predictors. No district proliferation, no um, province, uh, no province demand. But what about Bekasi, you mentioned? Can we select Bekasi? Well, I would love to do so, but it, <laughs> but it needs to be met the requirement based on the 20, 7,000 data that I cross tabulated. And then I found one, it needs to have a high conflict risk above 100 um, incidents and then medium and a low. And also, well, I can, I can just select from any other with very, very or absence or very low conflict incident. And also we know we as a researcher, we have to be, be care, really careful with our money, with our finding, uh, funding and also time. So why I stayed Purwakarta? Because it's close to Cirebon. Why? Because it's close also to, to Bandung. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Uh, well, cherry picking probably, yes, but it based on also, and um, there is explanation behind it. Okay, that's number two. Okay, number three, about power, power sharing. This is actually the topics that I would love to explore in the near future because I still think to this date that if we can have a regulations, a regulations that, um, that uh, only allow sort of a combination between the, the head or executive, head of the region, either Wali Kota or Bupati or uh, uh, governor, and the deputy of governor or deputy of uh, Bupati or Wali Kota with two different kinds of ethnic identity or not only ethnic identity, we can just take it native and non-native perhaps. Son of the soil and non-son of the soil or daughter of the soils. How is it? How the combination can also determine the likelihood of conflict? Actually, I had that studies already and um, there is well, I have to test it again, and I'm afraid to tell you right now. But based on that, we can we can sort of like project in the future. If we have this combination, then the likelihood of conflict will decrease. But unfortunately, also since I use the SNPK or National Balance Monitoring System database, um, they only have the data until 2014. So I cannot observe the data beyond 2014. I talked to persons that um, working with the data uh, 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 enrichment 
um, they haven't launched anything yet until today. So the fourth about potential uh, conflict to be anticipated, which is um, you mentioned about Papua um, case, um, I kind of afraid to um, um, make an assumptions about this because uh, Papua is very, very particular in this case, because um, one, the, the tribal kind of like culture. Um, the second one, because uh, how large the case has been under international community scrutiny. So anything that has the connections with the international spotlight, I think based on many other studies that's been done in Latin America and in Africa, if you have that uh, kind of connection, you and I really don't want to see it, but I don't know um, what to um, what to expect in the future. The East Timor case, if we are not careful enough, that's why we have to confront the fear of secession. If we are not careful enough, which means the national government is not careful to calculate the risk and calculate the benefit, and especially the calculations of a benefit should be uh, should be directed to the people, then we can lose it. Yeah, I think that's all that I can say. All right, uh, thank you, Rafi, uh, for your uh, response. Uh, next, I want to invite uh, Barita to give uh, your uh, comments and thoughts about uh, Rafi's uh, book. Uh, you you have uh, ten minutes for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pa Fajar. Um, uh, I would like to start with, um, of course, congratulating uh, Ratri for the publication of the book. Uh, congratulations. Um, this is really a, a really a good achievement um, that um, I, I'm uh, you know, I'm I'm really proud to actually have known you for uh, for many many years, even before you started your PhD. I think we we've known each other for 20 years. Yeah, it's a uh, it's been a long time, um, and uh, not everyone actually could publish from their PhD dissertation. So really, congratulations. Um, I should also admit that. I, I didn't publish my PhD dissertation either, so I was like, uh, so I was like, oh, um, I'm I'm so glad that you could do, you could do this. Um, this is actually not not easy to do. So again, congratulations for that. Um, and uh, my role here is a discussant, so I um, I hope I won't take too much time. Um, but since you know, uh, Ratri. Um, uh, you asked for it, okay, just now, uh, you know, being the last discussant, I learned from the previous two. And then I did note that you said that Arita was too generous um, and you were expecting more criticism. Um, so uh, so I was like, okay, so maybe I should I should change this a little bit. Um, so yeah, so that's um, the, um, the privilege of being the last one, right? So Ratri, you asked for this, right? So um, so, so get ready. All right. So uh, my comment will be uh, will really be focused on uh, three keywords that can be found um, uh, on in the title. Uh, first is about uh, territorial change. Okay. Uh, let's let's start with territorial change. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm actually uh, really glad that. Um, you actually focus on cases that are lesser known. Yeah, I think when we when we think about territorial change and conflict, um, straight away, uh, of course, we think about uh, you know um, the 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 new provinces that actually came to be. You know, um, like uh, Banten or Riau Islands, or you know. And then if we uh, if we think about conflict, then we uh, we uh, straight away think about areas that are really known for conflicts. Um, so I'm I'm glad actually that you focus on the uh, the the areas or, uh, that are uh, less under spotlight, um, but at the same time I was actually wondering right that um, you mentioned in the book uh, that you argue the author so that means you you argue that more provinces may be necessary to ensure the fair distribution of wealth that would enable the whole population to enjoy a similar quality of life and that the Indonesian government needs to wisely and strategically uphold its unity if a federal arrangement is not an option. Um, so I should also note here that I give my comments 
science as a sociologist, so I'm not a political scientist. So, um, so, so we may actually rely on the uh, on similar literatures because we are interested in Indonesia. Uh, but I, because I'm looking at this as a sociologist, when I, when you made this statement, then I was actually expecting that uh, you would uh, you would show uh, some impacts of the territorial change itself to argue for. Uh, this uh, assumption. So this basic assumption, uh, I'm, I just have my notes here. I was just wondering, has it been proven uh, that more provinces would ensure fair distribution? So I just note here, how many new provinces has there been in Indonesia? And are those provinces have proven that they have increased more fair distribution of um, of wealth. Uh, I remember one time actually attending a talk by Vedi Hadis, whose work was also cited in your work, that he argued that actually all these uh, decentralization are just uh, prolifer uh, proliferating uh, uh, little uh, uh, kings and queens of the new uh, territories uh, that uh, they will be able to um, to establish their own deals and all that. So again, uh, as a sociologist, I'm just wondering here the fair distribution of wealth that you're talking about in the in arguing for the importance of more pro uh, having more provinces. Uh, uh, is this really the wealth of the population uh, and uh, the the people of Indonesia, or is it really, um, uh, or or is it more uh, that the cases more you know proving that is more towards the elites? Because later on, uh, you talk about uh, the elites in the book, and it seems that uh, all these territorial changes seems to indicate that they are uh, carrying the elite interests. Um, I, uh, across the book also, even in the interviews, uh, I didn't really find uh, the voices of the people, of the people, of the ordinary people themselves actually wanting to, um, to have new provinces. So uh, you also mentioned in the book that the territorial demand cannot be divorced from the elite's need for increased political control in a larger geographical unit. Uh, so uh, again, this is the interest of the elites, right? So the fight to establish, so in Page 10, the fight to establish a new province necessitates negotiating by elites from marginalized areas in order to obtain consensus on essential issues. So it seems that the establishment of new provinces are just the interests of the elites. So what makes you believe uh, that uh, more provinces are still necessary then uh, if they are just carrying the interests of the elites rather than um, really uh, the interests of the people? Um, and uh, eventually, uh, this leads, you know, to a, a larger question about, you know, in the book you also mentioned about democratization and Indonesia as a large democracy. If this is just carrying the uh, interests of the elite, so uh, what happens to the democracy then? Uh, how can we take democracy seriously uh, if uh, these territorial changes are just representing um, the? Uh, the, the interests of the elites. Of course, this is nothing new. Yeah, uh, I think uh, there there are indications that um, that this is like that. But uh, I think this is actually a good uh, segue into you know uh, what will be the consequences of your study. Then um, should we then uh, quest, uh, critically question the status of democracy in Indonesia? Given that uh, it seems that all these territorial changes seem to be uh, just, you know, um, uh, the interests of the elites. Um, and OK, so um, I guess uh, the second uh, key word that I'm going to highlight here is conflict. Uh, so after territorial changes, so conflict. Um, when I saw the, the term conflict, right, um, actually immediately in my head, uh, I didn't really think about ethnic conflict before I read the book, okay? I should have actually read more into the synopsis, but I actually thought that it was going to be a conflict over natural resources. Um, but then uh, eventually I found that uh, you focus on ethnic conflicts, which is, uh, I mean, you you demonstrated from the um, from from the statistical analysis that there is this correlation between uh, uh, between the uh, ethnic uh, heterogeneity and uh, the possibility of conflict. However, I'm just wondering. I mean, as a sociologist, also uh, usually when we talk about um, 
about uh, different uh, um, uh, different categories or groups in the society. We ha we may have uh, different kinds of identity. Uh, as you said, it's not just ethnicity, it can be religion. Uh, but at the same time, I was just wondering when you talk about social groups, it's not just about identity, but also about economic class. And when we talk about economic class, we also talk about uh, control over resources. Uh, and when we talk about control over resources, uh, there are also systems of control uh, over land uh, and, uh, and over uh, all the uh, other things uh, that are in those uh, areas. And I'm just wondering, right, when you're, when you're checking for conflicts, um, did you also check whether these conflicts have any correlation with natural resources uh, and the uh, the significance of natural resources in that area? And I'm just uh, also referring to some of the indication in the book itself. It seems that the conflicts that happen, um, like for example, in the case of Bima, uh, you mentioned that there, there are actually social inequalities among ethnic groups. Uh, and I quote here, uh, it seems that uh, in this, so, so on page 14, uh, you said that in the case of Bima, uh, the persistent problem of economic and social underdevelopment contributes to an increasing level of frustration, which ultimately results in a confrontation. So there is this notion of economic and social underdevelopment. Uh, so how much is the conflict actually ethnic conflict or how much is the conflict is actually an, an economic conflict and, um, and really materiality? And I'm just uh, wondering here because you did mention about uh, several other uh, con ethnic conflicts in Indonesia. Um, and one of which, uh, and I, I know this will actually spark a little, um, uh, a little more sort of like disagreements here, um, but you mentioned the case about the um, uh, the uh, Pilkada uh, of uh, Jakarta in 2017, in which uh, you attributed uh, the conflict to ethnic uh, uh, to, to to ethnic and religious um, identities of the incumbent governor at that time. However, uh, there were already studies um, after that. Um, and uh, also as somebody who is an ethnographer involved in the field, I kind of uh, see that actually the, the trigger of the conflict itself is actually class segregation in which there, there is this fragmentation between the poor, uh, the middle class and the rich uh, in Jakarta. Uh, but then uh, the, eth uh, the ethnic and religious identity was fueled at the very end after all these, um, uh, all, all these persistent uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, a fragmentation of economic class. Um, so there was a study uh, by Ghani, uh, uh, by Edward Ghani uh, later on, as well as by uh, Amalinda Savirani and as Aspinall, saying that actually econ economic class is the one that attributes to the loss of the uh, in the election, the incumbents lost in the election, and not so much about identity, about religious and ethnic identity, although it does play a role as well. Okay, so I'm just wondering for uh, you to, to mention conflict here, but attributes all of them to ethnic conflicts. I'm just wondering whether we are missing something here and whether you check for any any possible spuriousness between the correlation of ethnic, ethnic and uh, conflicts and uh, the existence of natural resources. Uh, and uh, the the inequality of ownership and control over natural resources and the land that uh, uh, contains those natural resources in those areas. All right. And my third and last keyword is actually about the fear. I'm just repeating uh, Nino's, uh, uh, Nino's point here about whose fear. So she already asked the question. So I wouldn't really repeat the question here since you already answered. It seems that the fear is more, so, more towards like the central government is being fearful of secession. But I'm also going to highlight here, since you, you mentioned the case of Timor-Leste as the case of secession. And I think uh, that really depends on how you look at it. Uh, because if we if we look at it from the uh, from the angle of uh, Timor Leste, uh, they don't see it as secession. They see it as independence. Uh, because even in the uh, in the international perspective, uh, Timor Leste has never been acknowledged as part of Indonesia. Uh, and uh, even now, it's acknowledged that Indonesia actually invaded uh, Timor Leste and annexed Timor Leste. So if we think that there is already a secession that happened. 
actually, probably the central government shouldn't be fearful at all because there hasn't been any secession so far, right? Because what happened was that uh, an area that was an annexed um, actually uh, gained independence uh, eventually. So uh, the areas that are uh, already acknowledged as the territories of, of the Republic of Indonesia, so far, we haven't seen secession. So, uh, so yeah, so those three words that I just want to uh, put there and, uh, okay, but last but not least, sorry, uh, I just want to um, add on to this. Um, you also mentioned, I mean, I don't know really how to categorize this, but um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, success actually. A success, uh, the uh, success of territorial change. And I'm just wondering how you define success because uh, several times in your book, you mentioned about the failure uh, to, to, main, to retain East Timor uh, and then the success story of Papua. But I think if we think about uh, territorial change and conflict, of course, when we say that, okay, in Papua, there's already a quote unquote success story of the Pemekaran, new provinces have been established. But if we see about conflicts, um, how do you actually define success here if the territorial change actually doesn't really um, subdue the conflict and if the territorial change doesn't really bring uh, more wealth to the people? So yeah, so just adding on to that. Um, all right, so I'll just end here. Okay, Ratri, you asked for it, okay? So these, these are a series of probably uh, critical comments, but um, uh, please see this as constructive criticism and I look forward to uh, the discussion with you. Marathi, uh, I think you can respond to Marita's comments. Oh, well, uh, Rita, you really answer my response to get to get more criticism on my uh, book, and you did it very, very, uh, very eloquently and critically. And well, I, I really appreciate your comments, and I don't know if I can answer all of them. But for, forgive me if I can't, but uh, I really appreciate it. I will try to answer it one by one. So um, your comments based on keywords, right? So the first one is about territorial change. Um, because you mentioned so far, is there any proof about more provinces can lead to equal distributions or can um, also be interpreted as new provinces, new districts can be really advantageous to the people welfare, especially increasing them substantially. According to the study, well, um, we have to also understand that this is like an experiment, uh, Rita experiments that is um, um, made from the, the outside of Indonesia, actually. So the Big Bang decentralization, maybe you come up to that kind of term in my book, is actually some things that's been imposed to Indonesia because of the problems that's been inherently very, very chronic. Um, the relationship between the, the national and uh, local government and how the distributions of wealth has been really dominated or controlled by the governments in Java, for instance, uh, during 32 years of um, Suharto's era, authoritarian era. So by that abrupt kind of like experiment, Indonesian government, nationals, also local governments, they have to be like rushed on creating some kind of a policy that probably is not measured really well on how the indicators to get the, 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 the successful kind of like um, um, parameter. So in that way, when I try to observe and making my case, I also try to understand uh, how many districts and how many provinces so far has been created that can be categorized, like you said, categorized as successful in terms of distributing the welfare. The very theoretical arguments on why we should devolve the power from the national to the local government is because of the public service deliveries going to be closer 
um, delivered from the local government that is has a close proximity to the local people. That's the basic arguments. However, if you're starting to talk about people, especially who never had people who has a, a access to power but never got a chance to gain the the control over the resources in the regions, and by the time um, the opportunity is being opened because of this uh, uh, policy of a territorial autonomy policy, then they started, like Freddie Hadi said, they started to think that they can acquire all of those uh, wealth in the region and forget about the people itself. People itself, unfortunately, I don't know if I really mentioned that in my book, people itself has been again and again being neglected. The essence of the proliferations of the region itself is not that way. It has a very economic component in it. But then, because of the system itself is not solid enough, even after how many decades, we're going to have it, to have it for more than two decades, right? I mean, it's already past two decades. But what happened? Only 70%, according to UNDP um, uh, um, uh, report, um, this, uh, those are can be considered as a failure, not the success um, territorial autonomy. So we need, for me, we need to learn about how to anticipate this kind of um, um, a, 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 a pathway that lead to a failure. So what kind of thing that we need to focus? Unfortunately, I cannot focus for everything. Definitely, I cannot. But the thing that for me, from the parameter of deciding one district or one province to be proliferated, the very or the, the most typical difficult component to determine is about the ethnic fractionalizations. So that was my basic interest and sorry for 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 saying that maybe that's driven me to studies about ethnic identity or differences in an identity itself however if you're looking into the cases if you're looking into the cases then i provide explanations the alternative explanations that's not only focused on the successful regional proliferations or unsuccessful regional proliferations. In Bima, like you said, Rita, I also mentioned about the economic de development and uh, about the relative deprivations. So yeah, I cannot, I cannot really like explain everything from different kind of angle, like you said, but to me, it is very important for us to learn only for a snippet, for a snippet um, identity, um, a parameter, can we learn something from it? Yes, it hasn't been proven that uh, those are really uh, can be um, um, uh, success stories because it depends on how you define the success itself. If you're thinking that the esteem war is, a, is an unsuccessful story, um, it's also um, it's not fair. Um, uh, according to Rita. Yes, I, I agree with you. However, my job, I don't know because I'm half bureaucrat and also I'm half academia. So I think that the policymakers need to learn more about this. You have to know that we, um, despite of this economic development, despite of this conflict of resources, despite of these elites who's trying to um, mobilize people using identity, but in the end, they also the one who wants to control the economy. But you have to also think that there are components that you have to be really pay attention about, and that's people. Yes. Uh, okay. So. Um, Thinking about the conflict, it's uh, oh, this, that's number two, right? Uh, the conflict. So the conflict, um, basically, when I study it's about the, the, the database, I'm using the database and it has different type of conflict. So the ethnic conflict is just one of them. Other than that, there's a political, there is a, there's the, uh, the, the law, um, 
uh, related uh, conflict and um, is um, the mob and everything else. There are different kind of a categories of conflict. I tested each one of them. And I haven't really found anything that can be substantial to explain about um, this particular conflict and explain um, a, a, a conflict itself. And then there is one also uh, category of conflict that related with territorial autonomy. After I tested it against different kind of a conflict, I don't find any substantial uh, or significant uh, result. So the thing that I am um, um, trying to do is uh, replicate the study of the Basi Gaijin, right? And they are also using, they found the, the similarities of the problem with mine. So they use like the compilations of ethnic itself lumped together, no separation between ethnic conflict or mob kind of conflict or any other conflict. So they use it in one category, conflict, just conflict. But then that's going to deviate from my own interest, which is the identity conflict itself, right? So that's why I decide to do the cross cast comparison. So yes, I try to, di to divert the focus of the reader to the ethnic conflict and try to find whether there is an a, a existing ethnic identity conflict or not. It, you can blame it as part of me as being biased, but yes, that's how I end up with case study, which Thank you so much, Rita. You've already praised how um, as a whole, uh, uh, case selections being made is not focusing on the, the, the major, major um, areas. Okay. Um, you asking about the, um, the correlation with natural resources. Um, yes, I think I've already provided you explanations about that. And um, yes, I focus uh, on the elites because elites, uh, they are the one who's using um, ethnic rhetoric, usually during the campaign of um, an elections of the local heads, for instance. I mean, uh, the thing that I feel so sad about this research is about how this pabakaran uh, or how this regional autonomy has used uh, a, a lot of uh, arguments that basically focus on the people itself, the ordinary people, the one that's been neglected so far because they're minorities and so far and so on um, by these elites. And these elites focus on their own uh, power grab kind of a campaign. And then um, only a few people um, uh, from the, the, you may say lower class, be included in the government after they are successfully um, grab the power. But again, um, it is it is kind of hard for me to interview people without having to encounter uh, what do you call that suspicious. Um, that's part of uh, me probably that you are asking why um, there are like perhaps none. Uh, coming um, uh, out in the in the in the book itself, but I try, <laughs> I try because uh, uh, I interview um, a various um, a grassroots movement perhaps that can be representable. Uh, I obviously um, did not put that um, very uh, clearly in my book due to the danger. Maybe you understand about that. So I put it in the, in the, in the, um, uh, I don't know, put it in pseudonym or not. I just, just interview with someone. Uh, I also interview uh, like a cultural uh, preservationist that for what to me consider as um, people who's um, um, like in Cherubon, they know about uh, the history. They know how uh, people, because they represent people this ordinary people that happens to know history more than others that say that, oh, well, the province Cherubons won't be uh, emerged anytime soon because there's no need to have a new province. Uh, we are proud to be Cherubonese, part of uh, West Java, for instance. Okay, about the 2017s and um, yeah, 
I should probably read more about the other kind of like perspective um, because um, yeah, this research has been done in 2017. So there are more researches perhaps that I should probably include and uh, yeah. Um, number three keywords is about fear. So again, it depends, you're a sociologist. I really respect sociologists because you're cool. <laughs> because you study from different angles that not like political science, like me and Banino, for instance, and um, um, people in here and also has this kind of discipline. So you, you, you view things from different angles and you view things from how people interact, right? And how the stories develop from um, below. So to me, in my book and for me, writing this book, I really consider things that's related with the government, right? So that's my uh, basic idea. So confronting the fear is not confronting the fear from below, but confronting the fear from the government. I just want to tell them, government, you, you have to have a substantial argument if you want to respond to secession if some groups asking to separate from Indonesia, for instance, you don't do like what you did with Timor-Leste or East Timor. You have to do in other way. You have to provide them with evidence. You have to provide them with other things that perhaps makes those um, um, people think that Aligning with Indonesian government or Indonesia itself still worth enough for them. If you cannot provide with that arguments, then you will lose the, the, the territory. That's that's one of the thing that one of the thing that um, uh, they, they should um, uh, instead of uh, like building up on the fear, but building up on the reasons. That's one of my major uh, concern. Okay, success, how do you define success? It's again, this depend. The, the, the explanation that provided to uh, Mbak Aninos probably, uh, the success is only determined by, okay, this, uh, this is a new province, this is a new district, uh, but I agree, uh, it needs to be defined more clearly uh, because what to be defined as a success for the territorial autonomy should be, those people already serve well and getting better um, for their uh, income, welfare, and many other social amenities that they need to, to deserve instead of only a few people that enjoy a particular privilege. It's like creating new powerhouse, right? Raja and Ratu or... Uh, the Sultanate. Uh, no, Indonesian should not go that way, I think. And yes, we need to evaluate the territorial autonomy policy. What do we need to do? Creating a new province, more provinces? Yes, probably that's uh, going to be maybe a good answer, according to my arguments. But do you know, um, you don't need to be afraid of having them claim for separations. That claim of separations must be evaluated or assessed based on um, how much power can, can you lose or can you gain from becoming a provinces. That's why I don't think there are going to be many claiming for um, separations, but instead they will claim for new provinces. Okay, maybe. I don't know if that answer your questions or not, Rita. I'm so sorry if I neglect some of the uh, response. Um, but yeah, that's so far that I can uh, answer today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meratri, for your uh, response. Uh, next, uh, I think we still have time for one or two round of Q&A. So maybe uh, let's start the first round. Maybe we can take like three questions or comments. I uh, already see a uh, raised hands by uh, my name, right? All right, uh, do you want to, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, Mas Fajar. Uh, Ratri, very felicitations 
Yeah, you made it into a book, not just a PhD. Uh, my question is actually not so much related to the content, but more on methodology and uh, to probably for the audience to understand personally who Ratri as a researcher, because uh, Rita, uh, you mentioned in uh, responding to Rita, sorry if I only use Rita and Ratri, you've been friends for 20 years ago. Um, you respond that you ad acknowledge and you admit that there is a certain bias of you as a researcher. And interestingly, although I haven't read the book, it was mentioned that uh, your methodology is ethnography, which sort of like, as I understand it, and I would like to learn more because ethnography is one of the methods that I would like to employ, but I haven't had enough knowledge of it. But I understand that in ethnography, you need to state your position as a researcher. Are you insider? Are you outsider? You're biased and things like that. And I'm wondering, because I haven't read the book, if you actually address that bias so that your audience, uh, they don't misunderstand your statement claims or uh, assumptions or conclusion, because you have already stated that. Or if it's not mentioned, and if, you, if, if I ask you how you're going to describe your bias and how it's going to influence the content, the results of your research, how will that be? So that will be my question. Not as difficult as Rita's question, is being typical full writer, being so critical. But yeah, again, felicitations, Ratri. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Menini, for uh, your <laughs> questions. Uh, do we have like other people who want to ask? Uh, let's collect like two more questions, Meratif. Anyone? Actually, I have. Uh, I can see from the uh, chat box from the uh, chat box. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. You're right. So, uh, wait. Oh yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, Arita uh, was asking. I was wondering if you had considered conducting like a poll or survey to gather people's opinions about material change and conflicts. Uh, that's the second question. Uh, do we have the third one? Or do you want to respond first to those two questions, uh, Ratri? Right. Okay. Yes, okay, go ahead. Well, yeah, I will answer those two um, questions first. And for those probably wonder why, <laughs> why Rita and Nani uh, say that uh, we've already known each other for 20 years. And in fact, it's, it's honor, it's like a reunion to me because those people that I really, I really admire them, um, we are in the same um, family, Fulbrighters. We call ourselves Golden Fulbrighters. Um, so yeah, we've, we've known each other for a long time. So thank you so much, Neni. So that's another um, very critical questions, I think. So that's not that light, Neni. <laughs> That's very, very valid questions, I should say, because as a researchers, you have to um, really avoid your bias, right? And the way I avoid a bias, I don't tell my um, informants or respondents who am I, except that I'm just a student. And as a student, I have uh, this research about um, so on and so forth. And um, I, um, I, I would like to understand more about the, 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 the case, right? And um, to me, that's a very part, uh, the very hard, difficult part. Um, in interview people, that's not so much uh, difficult because people apparently they because they don't know about me, right? And I'm no one there. And I try to immerse with the situations in the local by dressing up like a local. I don't dress up like um, tourists, for instance. That to um, to them, um, they probably think uh, I'm so totally different than them. I'm just trying to be um, um, more um, um, making them casual um, in interact with me. So yes, that's one of the things. So yeah, I'm trying as hard um, uh, as uh, I could 
to present myself only as a researcher. And um, the very difficult part is when you try to analyze the, the evidence, the interviews, and how you avoid yourself having bias from my career, for instance, because I mentioned to you all that half of me, I'm a bureaucrat working in a campus managed by the government institutions. That's kind of uh, things that maybe to me um, will contribute to some biasness, especially when I targeted um, the policymakers in the national levels. But, you know, um, there's always weaknesses in doing research. That's why the only solely related uh, the 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 research with interview that to me is not enough. Based on my disciplines, you have to triangulate, right? You have to gather sources not only for the interview, but you also gather sources from, for instance, in my uh, book, in my study, I use um, media, the online media online media from the nationals and online media from the local to gain more insights about why I observe, to cross-validate, that's what it's called, the cool stuff, the word, cross-validate. My finding on in, uh, based on interview and other people's finding from their perspectives about what I see, what I try to analyze from the data. So having that document, online documents, I should say, that helps me to provide more context. I cannot judge this because of um, they only want to see power. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can study, um, observing from uh, the information in uh, media. And also, there is another um, information that I gathered is from the archive, from the report. Um, there's already studies about the Pemakaran itself in particular cases. So those are really helpful. And I'm talking, I was talking also to several people from the, um, from the academia. That I, I did that on purpose because I want to keep myself unbiased as possible. That's, that's the thing. So ethnography, when you were going deeper, Rita can also help me in this, or the anthropologist that's probably present here. Uh, you you cannot help yourself that you are um, you are mixed with people with so many people that your emotions can also be an influence. That's the very hard part of uh, uh, doing ethnographic study. That's what you should say, uh, Lenny. Thank you for coming. Love you, girl. Okay, from Barita. But Arita mentions about, okay, let me pull up her question. Okay, uh, I was wondering if you had considered conducting a poll or survey to gather people's opinion about territorial changes and conflict. Actually, uh, this one of the data that I, if I can have opportunity to study first, this is the one that I'm going to study. But the availability of those poll during that year, 2000 or 2014, is probably still very rare. To, uh, to, to provide me with a solid um, uh, information that I can use because I'm, I'm using the data that can tell me the time series and also a, sp a spatial uh, um, kind of like data. That's why I'm using the longitudinal data, but not the poll because of the scarcity of the data itself. Sometimes poll can be conducted one time during the initial, initial period of a Makaran, but then it's subsided after or there is no survey at all and then if there is um, one particular kind of a, like idea to gather all those districts has been makar to um to regroup or reunite to create the province probably perhaps there is going to be uh, a survey um i would love to do that and probably i would love to do that in like annual basis to find out whether um, there should be a nominations of new provinces or new district. We are still in moratorium, by the way. 
Uh, and I think why we are still in moratorium because of reasons. Because of reason, should there be more provinces um, emerge, um, maybe um, uh, without the without the good parameter of success, maybe that's not very good. So I contribute to one parameter, which is the ethnic uh, or um, uh, identity itself that needs to be considered. So yeah. That's Ma uh, Arita. Okay, thank you, Ma Arati. Uh, I think uh, we missed the third question, Ma Arati. It's oh, in the wait. chat box by uh, Banelli. Okay, Banelli is also she... my good friend. Yeah. Okay, should it's I read it? Chat. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, my question would sound naive, perhaps, but from what you said, the government needs to approach the possibility of succession from a different angle. And one of them is by providing evidence. Do you mind defining what evidence you refer here? Were you referring to the scientific evidence or something else? If it is the earlier, how confident are you with the government scientific approach? <laughs> Perhaps I just wanted to ask some clarification on what you meant by a different approach needs to be taken by the government and give some concrete example if you can. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. Where are you? So thank you for joining uh, my uh, book uh, launching. Uh, is um, an honor to have you here. So, uh, yes. Um, the approach of the governments, um, I mentioned earlier, focusing on administrative requirement. The number of um, people living in that particular areas, the, the size of the area itself, and then like, um, um, natural resources, like how many, like uh, how potential it is to be sustained by itself. Uh, however, um, in my study, I because I focus on the, the diversity of uh, the people living in uh, areas, so we cannot neglect them. However, it is very hard. I've already consulted about how to measure ethnic cohesiveness and how the potentials of conflict among identity related group. Um, Kementerian um, uh, Dalam Negeri uh, or Ministry of Home Affairs, the peoples that uh, have um, access to evaluate the, the, the proposals, they, they also ha have a hard time to define what kind of evidence that needs to be uh, measured, especially if we're talking about evidence, we need to have a measurement, right? And what kind of uh, things that we need to measure? That's one of the thing. And ethnicity from different kinds of perspectives from BPS or uh, a statistical bureau and uh, others, um, there's no such agreement about how to define the ethnic or identity uh, identity groups in um, especially Indonesia. There are more than 700 languages. We can define it by languages. There are more than 1,200 like ethnic groups. However, like I just visited the, the National Museum and saw in a mural on, the, on, that, on one of the, on the, one of the uh, building. And it's, um, it's give me an idea that um, we cannot really capture like how many it is, uh, the ethnicity that live in Indonesia, unless we really study about them seriously and consider that as a, 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 a tools to unite us instead of dividing us. So that's the evidence that I'm talking about. So I'm really open for discussions about that. And I'm hoping people who work on um, identity work harder to define on who we are because we don't know how to define ourselves. I think right now, imagine community, what kind of imagination, imagination that we have right now. So if we can go back to think that we have identity, but we use that identity not as to confront other or fight to others, um, especially the minorities, and we know our weaknesses, our strength, then it's okay to have more provinces if the theory is applied though. Okay. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Marathi, for your response. Uh, I think we still have 10 minutes. Uh, we, I think we still can have like a one uh, last uh, round of Q&A. Uh, we already have one question here or comments by Rebecca. Uh, let's take uh, uh, one last uh, questions or comments. Anyone want to ask or comment? All right. Um, that's from Rebecca Mileni. You can respond first okay. to Rebecca's uh, My comment. question, okay, my question if is if it's true political identity happened and already happened a bit in our government from your perspective, how can government, okay, wait a second, I cannot read this. How, how can, can government and public erase this identity politics, culture that, that happened? Happen? Knowing, knowing that, that we have a public that from different background. Well, definitely, oh, thank you for the question, um, uh, Rebecca. Um, the questions that we can erase or cannot erase identity, especially if those that are expected to delete or let it leave about the identity uh, that we have today is from the government. Um, I don't think we cannot we cannot we cannot say that um, identity can be deleted, and we cannot also or erase from the public uh, discourse. For instance, uh, we have already had mixed identities in our blood, and to me, yes, the world's becoming more global. And there is no probably boundary among us. We can mingle freely. Space and a boundary is probably not limited. We have digital technology that we can use to communicate with others. However, uh, we as human, I don't know if I studied this enough. We as human still need to go back to our roots. We need that roots. We have. We need identity. We are created different than one another. And that should be one thing that we rejoice again and again, not by making it as superiors against other, but making us to understand to others differences. That's the thing. I don't think that the identity and identity conflict, as long as you still use your identity to overpower others, then the conflict still be there. But if you think differently, using your identity to know that others perhaps have different kind of like identity and you learn, I don't think you need to erase them. All right. That's, all, that's also applied to religion, I think. Yes, thank you, Maratris. Uh, maybe one last question or comment. Yos, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Fajar. And thank you, Maratri, and congrats again for uh, for the publication of the book. And it's I'm, I'm glad to see it, to see the process from your dissertation writing. You're one of the witnesses. You're one of the witnesses. <laughs> yeah, I know how difficult it was, and uh, congratulations once again, Maratri. And um, my I just have a question, uh, maybe it's piggybacking on Barisa's previous comments on the interest of the elites, but uh, instead of uh, focusing on the material material aspect of the elites' interest, I would, I would like to know uh, about, uh, because you study Bima and also, and also uh, Toraya, right? And, and there's a two cases where where the in Bima right now is uh, dominated by the uh, royal family of uh, Bima Sultanate, while in Toraya it, uh, it didn't happen, right? Uh, the and I'm just wondering uh, how, or maybe not family interest, but how this uh, traditional uh, uh, entity uh, plays a role in. In you know shaping the dynamics of pemakaran, um, whether or not uh, they play a role in the success or failure of 
uh, that uh, kind of aspiration. Maybe um, it's a half big questions, but I I, I I hope you can guess uh, what I'm thinking about. So thank you, Barretta, and once again, congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, you're part of my success, and some of uh, folks here also contribute to the success of my book publication. Thank you so much. I, I genuinely um, feel so um, much uh, uh, joy to have you in here. Okay, so um, this is related probably with um, the dynasty, right? And I know that Yos um, Kanawas, and um, I just want to introduce to you to all. So he's now um, one of the resourceful persons if we want to talk about the um, politics of dynasty. Uh, thank you for your questions, Yos. Um, you asked me about how does traditional entity shape the dynamic of Pamakaran. I should say it's probably, well, 90 something percent. They are they are really uh, play this uh, uh, an, an important role to shape the Pamakaran politics. Um, the dynamic of uh, Pamakaran, um, you need a pioneer. Uh, yes, um, the pioneer itself uh, to me is related with the ethnic compositions. So um, connecting to my study and. Are the provinces that I don't observe in my study, but it's already um, they are successfully established, such as Sulawesi uh, Barat, for instance. So I interview some of those um, elites uh, from Sulawesi Barat, and they give me some important informations about the relationship between the ethnicities and the relations between those probably connected with the royalties that play a very significant and dominant role to suppress the minority group and let this dominant group to mobilize under one ethnic group. So the suppression itself is very, very, um, very significant and substantial and needs to be there. So that's one of the things that I'm worried if the government, the national government, they don't, um, they don't study this well, the dominant will suppress the, the minorities. And if or should it be successful in creating a new Pamakaran or new region, that kind of predominations, unless there is consensus, that is why I would like to study about the power sharing, which kind of power sharings that can be more beneficial or less beneficial. Then it will carry it on until the new regions establish. And related to what, what Rita said, because mainly those, the one that has power in the region, they are mainly coming from the elites. They're the one that previously had power or has been stripped by the authoritarian regime perhaps and they want to come back. Those are the questions in Bima and also those are the questions in Toraja itself. And yes, that's my answer. The traditional entity shaped the diamond make of Pamakaran. And yeah, we have to be really careful or, 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 or in giving uh, the, or granting the new Pamakaran especially the province, because province has multiple, uh, inhabited by multiple uh, people with multiple identities. How to not neglect the people from different group? That's one of the key questions that I hopefully can observe in my next book. Thank you Thank so you, much, Varate. Uh, okay, uh, I think that concludes our uh, event for today. Uh, we just want to say thank you for Baratris for his uh, great book. Uh, congratulations once again. And we also want to thank you for all the discussion. Uh, 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 Rita and uh, Nino for giving uh, your insightful thoughts and comments to Baratris book. 
Uh, we hope to see you again in the next discussions, as I mentioned in the early of this uh, today's event. Uh, we're going to have uh, other discussions uh, related on topics about space and politics in Indonesia uh, in May. So please, uh, if you are interested, please sign up uh, for uh, those uh, events. Uh, once again, uh, if you are interested in buying the book, you can find the information how to buy the book through the link uh, in the chat box. Uh, thank you all. Uh, please uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you all. Uh, bye. Saya izin meninggalkan tempat. <laughs> Terima kasih ya Mbak Nino. Terima kasih Mbak Ati. Ya. Uh, selamat untuk bukunya lagi-lagi. Semoga Menarik. kita bisa diskusi ke depannya ya. Aku pamit juga ya Ratri. Ada meeting hey, thank lagi. Thank you so much ya girl. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, ya. Selamat ya. Selamat. Bisa selamat ya. Selamat. Menjawab uh. semua. <laughs> <yang bisa. laughs> Maaf kalau terlalu banyak komen. Oh, it's okay. Tantang I, you know, I know you. <laughs> Justru harus dong cerita. Salam kenal ya Mbak Nino. Nah, ya, sampai ketemu lagi ya. Sukses okay, selalu bye -bye. ya. Bye. 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 Bye.